It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. You feel the powerful vibration of the chainsaw chiming to life in your hands. The blades spinning makes the destructive tool sing. Even as you press the chains against the old and tall tree, the chainsaw continues its tune. One tooth after another pulls at the fibers of the tree and strips away the bark, trying to protect it. As the chainsaw digs deeper into the tree's interior, you see wafts of dust slipping out and swirling into the air. As you breathe in, the tool still rattling your hands, you can feel bits of sawdust drift into your mouth, coating your tongue. It's a bitter and gritty taste that you try your best to ignore. But with the blade halfway through, the tree becomes weak enough to topple over. You realize the once small bitter taste starts to resemble a burning, as if hot wax was building in your mouth. The sawdust emitting from the tree begins to swirl rapidly. It dances and condenses despite the calm wind. The more you look, no longer digging the wound more profound, the more the dust starts resembling a familiar figure. The hot wax now feels more like steaming coals, so it hurts to breathe. With hot air in your lungs, you watch in awe as the dust takes a solid shape. The vague figure of a human crafted from the remnants of the tree stands in front of you, angry and vengeful. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. This week we're talking about the typically peaceful Japanese nature spirit, Kodama. This show is part of the EerieCast podcast network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com and follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow, and hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. You can now find Freaky Folklore videos on YouTube as well. And if you love scary places with dark history, you can also join me on my other show, Destination Terror, where I discuss a new terrifying destination every other Wednesday. If you would like to submit an encounter, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Are you, like, so super sure we're allowed to go in there? At the sound of her voice, Matthew rolled his eyes. He wondered for a moment how many times they had this conversation since getting off the plane. If it weren't for the droning and shaking of the small passenger plane they took, surely he would have heard the same question on the flight as well. Yes, Heather, I'm like so super sure. His own words came out with more spite than mockery. He could tell by the look on Heather's face when he looked back at her. A scrunching of her eyebrows conveyed that he hadn't crossed the line, but he was touched in, I promise, I read the rules over and over. Thousands of people go into these woods. Plus, there haven't been any signs telling us to turn around. He could see her deliberating in her mind. Her eyes nearly darted around as if she was watching the thoughts bounce around. Then, to Matthew's relief, He saw her eyebrows relax and her posture drop. Yeah, I guess, just feels kind of wrong. She looked out to the tree line they were about to cross. 
Like when you're in someone else's house, you don't just go into their bedroom. She kept trying to let go of how frustrated she was. He was trying to fix things, but the way he sprung the trip on her balled attention inside of her, like every word he said twisted and pulled at her nerves. Matthew smiled and looked back at the tree line. Hell of a bedroom. They stood together admiring the view. The tall trees made a wall before them. The thick bustle of leaves on each branch made the sight look more impenetrable. This and dark tree trunks scattered about like mountains. He felt a soft hand slip into his as Heather acknowledged the statement. Things had been rough at home for them. They could both feel their bodies tightening up the longer they stayed in the apartment together. They would feel the words they said to each other becoming unkind. They hated it, but they couldn't stop the tension from bubbling. The fresh air, though, it was almost enough to make them forget about how they had put the whole trip onto credit cards. The view was hard to beat, and allowing them to get away from their house was priceless. It was as if they had forgot to pack all of their woes. They left it all sitting on the counter to collect dust. They could ignore it all, if only for a few days. Well, come on. If you're this nervous now, we don't want you to be out here when it's dark. Matthew spoke with a humorously deep voice, mocking a display of bravery. He tugged at Heather's hand. She took a moment to appreciate the landscape around them before the trees should swallow them up. Gentle wisps of fog rested over long stretches of gloomy green grass. She wished they had brought the supplies to have a picnic. It would have been lovely. Though her thoughts were interrupted as the pull from Matthew increased, likely not paying attention to her enough to see she hadn't moved yet. She relented, though, seeing that he hadn't turned around again, and so her steps fell in time with his. There was a deepening in their hearts. As they approached the tree line, the wall of green seemed to climb higher and higher, until the pair worried it might crash down on them. The gap between them and the trees closed nearly instantly, the teeth of bark and gums of foliage swallowing a small and simple snack. The pair could almost feel the change in pressure, the atmosphere and temperature being noticeably different than when in the open air. In particular, the way the gentle rolling wind was cut entirely off upon entering the woods like closing a heavy door as you leave a party. Conversation and clatter all turned off instantly. Heather watched Matt's back as they trekked deeper into the woods. She could see over his shoulder the app he was using to track their location. The lines seemed to be drawn with each footstep, one they would retrace when they turned around to leave. Every so often they would stop to admire the landscape. Whenever there was an especially interesting tree, or a collection of wildlife gazing despite the human disturbance. Time was something they began struggling to keep track of. The sun peeked through the trees, casting bright shapes on the ground. It became difficult to tell what direction the light was coming from, though, with how the canopy seemed to warp the light and twist it to its whimsy. Still, enough breeze would rattle the canopy, causing the lights on the ground to dance like ghosts. How far did we want to go? Heather spoke up. They had been making idle chit-chat the whole walk. Nothing too deep, but at least they weren't fighting. We can find a nice place to sit. That should be good. He responded, head on a swivel, in an attempt to see somewhere to rest. As he searched, he felt a slight tug on the back of his shirt, demanding his attention. Turning to Heather, she pulled to his shirt more, until his body was next to hers. I suppose that will do, yeah. Their gazes landed on a tree. Its stump seemed to bow out and twist, almost as if making a natural bench. It was a thick and sturdy mass that stood out proud under the cascading light. It called to them. Its beauty was somehow unmatched in a sea of beautiful things. Not just the sight, but the way it made them feel. A lighthouse for those lost at sea. 
Only upon pushing through the surrounding shrubs did the pair notice the rope tightly tied around the tree. It was a pristine white rope that blended in with the sun rays dancing over it. Matthew let his eyes follow the string, daring it to show any imperfections. The only blemish he spotted was the thin red banners that hung off the rope, purposefully tied at consistent distances. Heather stepped over to the tree first, letting the sun embrace her, just as it was the tree. A finger dangled cautiously from the rope. She couldn't help but think about how clean it was despite being surrounded by wilderness. It was as if someone had come along just before they showed up and tied the rope. Maybe a different tree? She questioned as Matthew's feet crunched against the ground marking his approach. Are you kidding? This is the tree. He said, lifting his arms to make a gesture of grandeur. Though he dropped his stance in defeat upon noticing that Heather was still content to concentrate her sights on the rope. We'll just sit for a minute. Maybe the rope is just like a trail marker or something. Maybe. Her word wasn't a matter of agreement, but rather the stoking of the possibility. She could feel the threads lightly tug at her finger now as she ran it across the rope. A small scraping noise chimed as she traced the twisting pattern, her finger falling short just before the red banner. Even though her finger had halted, though, she could still hear the scraping. Matthew's frame had suddenly appeared on the other side of the tree, the fabric of his black shirt dancing in and out of view as he moved. Heather quickly rounded the tree to see what he was up to. She felt her face scrunch up as she watched him dragging a knife into the bark of the tree. If she hadn't zoned out, she could have stopped him, but it was too late. The initials M and H were carved into the tree with a jagged heart drawn around them, like they were in middle school. Matt! She exclaimed, a tone he initially took as excitement. But upon letting her voice marinate, he could hear the disappointment. What? We'll be out here forever now, until this tree grows into the sky. He shouted in reply, trying to drum up the flame of romance. Heather grew quiet, though, and her stern face dripped into curiosity. He turned his head to see what had garnered her eye. From where he carved their initials, Matthew watched a thin red liquid pouring out. They watched as the crimson lines formed on the tree. He thought it odd how his stomach churned when the liquid reached the ropes and sullied the blank perfection. I want to leave, Heather stuttered out. Her words were straightforward and demanding. Matthew could feel their influence echoing what he was already thinking. Failing to speak in response, Matthew just nodded his head and, like when they entered, pulled Heather's hand to conduct her to follow. The pair immediately started to feel sick. The sun shining off the liquid coming out of the tree burned the image into their mind, like they were seeing the veins in their eyeballs. At some point, Heather's hand slipped from his. The churning in his stomach made him move faster and faster. The sound of branches scraping at his clothing and leaves hitting his face echoed. The echo was loud, maybe louder than the original noise itself. Not only that, but the timing was off. You would have thought he was shouting into a ravine. The delay between the original noise and its echo was uncanny. It made Matthew dizzy. Enough so that he stopped in place to catch his breath. The sound of his final footstep took seconds to reach his ears again. This is when he realized he was alone. Heather? He whispered. Still trying to get air into his lungs, his voice was unintentionally soft. Taking his hands off his thighs, he stood up straight and repeated himself louder. Heather! The tension in his chest eased as he saw Heather walk out from behind a tree. She was timid, though, figure shrunken over holding her stomach. Her pitch black hair covered her face. Shoot, sorry, almost lost you. Matthew mangled out, still feeling the illness in his stomach. Heather failed to reply, though. 
She only looked down at the forest's floor. Hey, I'm sorry, all right? I just... As he went to rest his hand on her back, he felt no resistance. Instead, his fingers started passing through her shirt and skin. It felt like he had dipped his hand into a jar of honey. Thick and warm, he watched horrified as his hand plunged deep into what he thought was his lover. Heather's gaze started lifting, and through the strands of hair Matthew could see her eyes, or what he wished with all his heart were her eyes. Two large black orbs were staring back at him, nearly blending in with the shade of her hair, bottomless and vengeful. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate. What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Japan is a country steeped in folklore and superstition. In a culture of stories, whimsy, and pantomime, you'd be hard-pressed to find an object that doesn't have its spirit attached to it. These spirits are called yokai and are attached to humans, things, and nature. Even though the Kodama were once believed to be deities of higher power, over the centuries the Kodama became one such yokai that is said to inhabit trees. The term Kodama is also used to denote a tree that might have the namesake spirit residing in it. While the trees housing a kadama may seem normal on the surface, one who cuts it down will become cursed. The trees housing kadamas are also said to bleed when scarred. Though knowledge of which trees are kadama would typically be known by local elders, there is also a phenomenon of delayed echoes that is attributed to the presence of kadama. This phenomenon, like the yokai and the tree, is also referred to as kadama. The actual appearance of a yokai when not residing in a tree is certainly something that is up for debate. The older text describes the kadama as ghostly lights that shift into the shape of animals and humans. There are even stories of kadama that opt to take the shape of a human and end up falling in love with an actual human. Lore about the kadama has become increasingly open-ended, allowing for many modern interpretations of the once revered yokai. Perhaps one of the most famous interpretations of the Kodama has shaped the modern image ultimately. In 1997, critically acclaimed director Ayato Miyazaki and animation juggernaut Studio Ghibli 
released Princess Mononoke. The film follows a young prince thrown into a conflict, erupting between gods of the forest and the men who harvest its resources. It's within this conflict that we see the likes of many Kodama making their appearance. In the film, they are depicted as small and pale creatures, with amorphous bodies and large heads. The heads only sport three dark circles, two for eyes and one for a mouth, giving almost an extraterrestrial appearance. With the film's overwhelming success, the depiction of the Kodama seems to have been culturally altered. And while Princess Mononoke is likely the most popular appearance of Kodama in media, it is far from the only one. Wizards of the West Coast would use the Kodama's lore and name to release a set of cards, depicting various tree-like entities for Kodamas representing the cardinal directions, all strictly conform to the green color of the cards, to signify their consistent relation to nature. But perhaps most interesting is the possible relation Kodama has to none other than the Japanese mega-franchise and cultural icon, Super Mario. In the game Super Mario Galaxy 2, within the level Shiverburn Galaxy, if the player was to stop and look at the skybox, they would see a group of figures looming over them. People hacked into the game to get a better look at these figures. The beings watching Mario are much larger than the player, though they sport very few features of their own. Being only dark masses with two empty eye sockets represented by white orbs, Two of the four figures have arms on either side, while the other two shorter ones are without them. When looking at the game's code, the element for the skybox is labeled Beyond Hell Valley. These figures are so enigmatic, having never been officially acknowledged by Nintendo, that theories begin running rampant in search of answers. A creepypasta detailing a gamer's interaction with these creatures was able to get a decent buzz due to the vague nature of these entities a story that lived alongside many other modern folklores that we've discussed before. People believe these figures could be aliens or skinwalkers, but it is also widely believed these creatures are, of course, Kodama, owing to their similar appearance to the one found in the Studio Ghibli film. This wouldn't be surprising, as races within the Legend of Zelda series like the Kokiri from Ocarina of Time and the Koroks from The Wind Waker are also thought to be interpretations of the Kodama, due to their appearance and connections with nature. Regardless of how Kodama is represented, whether they're bringing good fortune to those who pray before elder trees, or curses to those who would cut them down, their presence can be felt throughout the ages. Like the sound of Kodama themselves, their legacy echoes long after their initial impact. And still, on the volcanic island of Algashima, shrines are constructed under elder cryptomeria trees. And within the village of Mitsune, whenever a tree is cut down, the villagers pray for forgiveness from the Kodama, showing that still, whether within media, the hearts of natives, or the trees themselves, the Kodama lives on. The being, the sound, the tree. The liquid felt much denser coming out than it did going in. Before, it felt to Matthew like he slapped his hand into water, but as he tried to pull away, it felt like the liquid was holding on to him. He could see ripples in Heather's figure as he struggled, her skin becoming more and more pale. The features of imitation Heather's face started to fade away. All the dark and hanging hair was sucked into those wide voids that Matthew only assumed were eyes. Though, when Imitation Heather opened her mouth, it too was a darkness that started sucking in the illusion around it. The more the image of Heather was eroded, the more Matthew could feel his hand starting to burn. He struggled and pulled harder and harder. His arms started to get free. He could see where the skin had become redder. It wasn't burning. It was more like it was dissolving him or eating him, like how a tree absorbs nutrition and water from the ground. Once his fingers were free, the force he was using sent him reeling onto his back. The figure got taller and its body moved like loosely held together water, surface tension threatening to break at any moment. Its head grew in size and the figure hunched over as it became top heavy. 
Matthew could see that his fingertips were oozing out blood. It felt like needles jabbed into the raw and wet skin as he pressed down to steady his body up. Getting up while moving back, he started to retreat from the figure. All the noise he caused made the spirit ripple like stones thrown into a lake. The ripple covered the spirit's body until it reached its dark circles, and Matthew could hear the noises he had just made being repeated to him. What are you? He screamed as he stood up, able to see his words forming lines on the spirit's body until surprisingly, he heard his voice coming back at him. It sounded alien. He knew it was the same voice as his, but seeing it come out of another creature made his skin crawl. He had decided that he wasn't going to get an answer, and as he turned around and started his retreat, his chest pumping until his heart was tapping the back of his ribs, fingers balled into a fist so hard he could nearly feel each nerve ending on his fingertips screaming out. Still, no matter how hard he ran, he could tell the figure was close behind. He could hear all his rustling and panting echo back. Each time the echo seemed to get closer to him. He wanted to scream, to plea for it to leave him alone, but he didn't want to hear those words fired back at him. It couldn't be that far, he thought. He briefly remembered walking into the forest with Heather. The thoughts of her still swirled in his mind. He could feel the ping of guilt for running away trying his best to tell himself that he was leading it away from wherever she was, all the while knowing that each footstep he took brought him closer to the edge of the forest. With a quick shuffle into his pocket, Matthew was relieved to discover that he hadn't lost his cell phone when he fell over. Trying to focus on running and the screen in his hands, fingers navigated to the app he had used on the way in. When it loaded back up, he could see very clearly the thick black line marking the path they took. He smiled, seeing that it appeared to be a straight line. All he had to do was be mindful of a few small twists and turns, and he would be home free, released from the canopy of leaves, where he told himself he would recoup and look for help or run back in for Heather. Eyes focused on the trees ahead, he could see that translucent shapes were starting to sprout out from the bark, when enough mass had dripped and could see that some of the larger ones had formed three dark orbs, like the one chasing him. He tried his best to avoid the growing spirits, but he brushed up against one of them. His cheek ever so slightly grazes the strange consistency of a spirit emerging from a tree next to him. It felt like he pressed his face against a fly trap and tried to pull it away. He could feel a chunk of his skin tearing away leaving the side of his face with a rough and raw burning patch. With the things taking up increasingly more space between the trees, Matthew started to hear his echo coming from every direction. It was hard enough to focus before, but he could feel his balance shifting with each labored step. He had been running for too long. He should have cleared the woods. Broken through the tree line like crossing a 5K finish line, he had to stop. There wasn't enough fuel left in the tank for him to keep running. With the sickness returning to his stomach, all he could do was slowly lower himself to his knees. The sticky red continued dripping from the wound on his cheek, getting lost in the dark t-shirt. It was the trees. He could see them. At first, assuming he was seeing things due to overexertion. But the more he watched, sure enough, the more he could see that the trees themselves were shifting. As the spirits left the trees, the patterns on the bark would twist. The thick trunks would shift slightly in various directions. It was like the whole forest was repositioned. He ran far enough to escape the forest. If it weren't for the very forest itself making sure that he'd never make it. Remapping the route he would have to take to escape, the spirits coalesced around the human, scrambling around their forest floor. His red fingers dug into the dirt like he thought he would dig through the earth and escape. They landed gently on Matthew's frame, and he could feel the dissolving starting to set in. Heather had long since lost sight of Matthew, 
She tried her best to keep focus on his shirt. With how fast they were moving between trees, though, she quickly discovered she couldn't keep up. The pain in her stomach and the exhaustion in her chest made it hard for her to cry out to him. She couldn't muster the strength to ask him to slow down. Before she knew it, his footsteps had vanished into the distance, and she found herself alone and lost. Matthew had the phone with the tracking date, and all hers had at best was a spotty signal. Not nearly enough to try and get a call out with. She walked slowly, thoughts teetering between wanting to try and find Matthew, or if she should stay put and hope he finds her. She could feel a balloon of fear inflating in her chest. One foot after another, stepping around like she was line dancing. As she turned to one of the trees, she could feel herself almost topple over. One of the larger trees in front of her was moving, the lines of bark waving around. Trying not to fall over, her hand rested against the tree, and sure enough, she could feel the bark wriggling her palm. It was like a larger millipede had squirmed between her digits. She backed away in disgust. Her heart sank lower when she saw the bark had warped in such a way that the tree appeared to be sporting a pair of eyes. It was a vague pattern, one she wouldn't even notice if she wasn't paying attention. But there were two knots in the tree that moved closer to each other and scrunched like a pair of scornful eyes. Her breath escaped her, and she turned away from the tree and mustered the energy to start running. She thought they had put a good amount of distance between them and the tree with the white rope before getting separated. But upon turning around, it was still in sight. Heather had always been the one more into legends and folklore. She would go on and on while Matthew focused on his computer. Something inside was telling her not to run away but towards it and she did, while Matthew tried to escape the woods. Heather made her way to the tree with the rope around it. As she drew closer, she could feel the heaviness in her stomach loosening up, and the tree that was squirming on the bark around her started to settle down. After a couple of minutes, she made her way back to the tree, the pristine white rope now matted with quickly drying sap, making it look rusted and ancient. She took her paces up to where Matthew had dug his knife into the tree. It still seeped the same sap, a seemingly never-ending stream. There was a noise that hung in the air. It sounded like a cacophony of echoes, all layered onto each other. And once listened to as one source of noise, it sort of sounded like rushing water or a falling tree. She took a breath and lowered herself to her knees in front of the scar Matthew had made. She understood he had made a few scars on her as well. Nothing so brandished in the skin, but the way he was distant, the things he said. She was always worried he wouldn't be there when she needed him. And kneeling in front of a tree, as he writhed on the ground, this fear was confirmed. The trip was never her idea in the first place. You can't just fix things by going somewhere new, by running away. You have to dig your heel in and face the music you made. Her fingers interlaced and she closed her eyes. I'm sorry. Her words drifted out and the sap vibrated on the tree, offering an echo. Matthew was running out of time, his anger bubbling like the spirits closing in around him. They would touch his skin causing intense pain to erupt in the afflicted area. Matthew would scream and squirm, causing the spirit that did it to momentarily retreat before starting to close in again. This caused a strange game of whack-a-mole, as more chunks were dissolved from his skin. Approach, pain, scream, retreat. Approach, pain, over and over. His skin was more rash raw than plush pink, his screaming got weaker and weaker. More blood and flesh and bone were being offered to the specters that haunted him, all the while repeating his pain back to him ad nauseum. She begged and begged for forgiveness, pleading that she be forgiven for the acts of another. A wind pressed against tears that had fallen down her cheek, a mixture of fear, pain, and regret. 
It was cold, enough of a chill to get her to open her eyes, enough of a chill to allow her to witness the tree. The scar that was dug into the bark looked to be healing. First, the heart started to vanish, just as it had done some time ago. And as Matthew was eaten away, his body being consumed by the forest, Heather watched the tree healing itself. Dark liquid that stained the rope started to spill back out of it, like it had been wrung dry, returning to its luxury white. Matthew's body was an offering, giving back to the very same forest he had vandalized. If Matthew had listened a little more to her, maybe he would have known about the various folklore surrounding their little vacation spot, about the yokai that linger in trees, that takes revenge on those who scar their flesh. By the time they were done with him, there was nothing. All that Matthew had to offer was taken. The final sounds created with Matthew's body echoed out to the audience of no one. Heather sat at the tree for a while, perched right on the perfect bench-like root, waiting for a voice she felt she'd never hear again. She could see the bark of some of the trees in the distance shifting, and with her heart settled, she stood up and began walking towards them, hoping that they would send her on a straight path out of the woods. It took a while, longer than she remembered it taking them to walk in, but eventually, just as the sun began its descent past the horizon, she freed herself from the canopy and took one more look back at the still forest behind her and the spirit that inhabits it. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Destination Terror, hosted by me, Carmen Carrion. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Until next time, stay safe out there, because this world is a strange one.